Hello, welcome to Eyes Wide Open with me, your host, Lawrence Eastman. Today's guest is Jerry Marzinski. Jerry has over 35 years experience as a psychologist with a degree in psychology, a master's in counseling, and two years of study in a PhD psychology program. Jerry is now retired, but spent most of his career in the Arizona State Hospital and the Arizona State Prison. During that time, Jerry studied the thought processes and voices of psychotic and criminally insane patients in some of the most volatile psychiatric institutions in America. Since retirement, Jerry has co-authored a book called An Amazing Journey into the Psychotic Mind, Breaking the Spell of the Ivory Tower. The book charts Jerry's extraordinary experience working with paranoid schizophrenics and what the voices in their head really mean. So, Jerry Marzinski, welcome to the show. It's a real honor to have you on here today, Jerry. Um, as we talked about in your introduction, you're, you've got vast experience in the prison system and the mental hospital institutions. Can you give us a little brief introduction to your background as a psychotherapist working in these institutions and the type of places that you worked in and how you got into such a line of work? Well, to give you a, a little bit of background, you know, I'm a, I was licensed psychotherapist for over 35 years, closer to 40 at this point. And I've been studying the thought processes of uh, psychotics and the uh, criminally insane now for uh, most of my career. Um, you know, the, psychology and psychiatry did a good job of describing what these disorders were. But one thing that stuck out when I when I was in school was they didn't have any solutions. They had a, a very detailed descriptions of what these things were and all this theoretical stuff of what caused it, but they didn't have any solutions. So that always puzzled me. It's like, what causes mental illness? So I, I've, I started off working in one of the biggest if not the biggest psychiatric hospital on the planet, uh, Central State Hospital in Georgia at the time. And it was the size of a small city. I mean, there, here's these massive brick buildings with, uh, uh, you know, windows there and locked wards and bars in front of the windows. And uh, I remember at night, I went out walking when I first got there and you can hear the screams of the mentally ill just echo off into the night. Uh, and I remember standing in front of one psychiatric unit and I'm looking up in the window and here's this, this old lady just appears and all I could see is her shadow in the window. And she's looking down at me and I'm looking up at her and you know, I'm, I'm wondering about what, what she's thinking and, I, and she's probably wondering what I'm doing out there in the dark staring up at her in the window. But I'll never forget that image when I, I first saw that. But uh, when I first got to Central State, there were close to 10,000 patients there. Uh, every every form of mental illness in the, uh, that you could ever imagine was in there, uh, and for me it was it was like uh, I was fascinated with mental illness. I mean, it started with my first abnormal psychology course, uh, and it just went from there. So I was like a kid in a candy store. You know, what do you think? All, what, do you, what do you think drew you to that specific area of psychology? Was what, why was you, why was it like a candy store to you? You know. Well, I, I think like most psychologists, I, you know, it, it was like trying to straighten out my own head. I came from a, a very violent and dysfunctional family, which was probably the best training I could have ever had for working in these institutions. Yeah, because yeah, it's like uh, after dealing with my father, it was like a deal with some of these psychotic guys and go, yeah, what else you got, buddy? <laughs> you know? So uh, it, I couldn't have had it, it, any better training for, for that than and the family background I came up with, which was fairly dysfunctional. So I'm trying to straighten out my own head. And then it's like uh, hit abnormal. And, and it's like, th this happened to all of us studying abnormal psychology. It was like, oh, I got that in me. And then you move to the next one. It's going, yeah, I got that too. And I got that too. And I got, you know, it, it's all these different things. And, and, and we're all sitting there going, well, we got all these things, you know, to different degrees. So it, it's, a, it's a continuum, you know, it, it's, not, it's not like psychiatry says, well, between here and here. I mean, it, it's, it's a continuum. It, it, it's 
like the human continuum. And they just break these things up into different segments and say, this is this, and this is that, and this is this. They make a name for it. <clears throat> they give it a label. They give it a number so they can, they can uh, uh, charge the insurance companies and they hereby declare it a mental illness. So some of the mental illnesses this, they've had. Is this the, to do with the DSM? Yes. And how psychiatry creates new conditions by consensus yeah. during a vote. And yeah, then it's they, entered into the DSM and that's then called, you know, mental illness. Yep. Yeah, they make them up. You know, there's not a single t clinical test for any of these mental illnesses that they've come up with. And they started with uh, three or four, I mean, dementia precox, which, you know, schizophrenia was one of the first ones. And then they just uh, slowly made them up, made them up one after another, one after another. And then uh, in the late, what was it? Uh, I think probably in the 30s, uh, the Standard Oil guy and, and Rothschilds and some of these Rockefeller. others. Yeah. Rockefeller. Yeah, they <laughs> came up uh, and they, they went, okay, uh, any medical school that's teaching anything other than pharma, pharmacological medicine will not be licensed. And they they had all the all the money in the strings. So here they they put out of business all these other therapies that were going on at the time. You know, electrotherapy, naturopathy, uh, all these other forms of therapy. And said the only legitimate one is are the ones that are. Uh, have pharma pharmacological background kind of thing, so they they is virtually this, hijacked the, the, the formation of the FDA. Was, was it the FDA that issued the licenses for the pharmacological uh, practices? Well, the FDA is for the drugs. Um, you know the Flexner report. So so they they fabricated this report, paid off a bunch of senators and congressmen to vote on it. Here it is. Okay, the Flexner report, it was pushed through uh, in 1910. It was pushed through Congress by the Rockefellers and the Carnegie Foundation. Uh, and the Rockefeller Group sponsored the infamous Flexner report, which shut down any medical school teaching subjects outside of mainstream pharmacology. So at that point, they actually hijacked the medical system. The edict was so powerful that only a few medical schools survived, uh, like John Hopkins and McGill and a handful of others connected with these these groups. Uh, they were the only schools who could legally license doctors uh, and doctors who practice any method outside of pharmacology were threatened with the loss of their licenses. So, you know, stuff that was coming out at the time, like Tesla's Violet Raid that was proliferating about that time and used for all kinds of treatments uh, were shot down. Anything other than uh, drugs. Uh, people who worked with other kind of stuff, naturopaths, uh, electro medicine, any other kind of medicine, were considered quacks. So here's these, uh, the, the deep state had hijacked the medical system at that time. You know. When and, did you discover this as a, you know, a, a newly qualified psychotherapist? When did you start to realize the fraud <laughs> of psychiatry and the the hoax it's playing against unsuspecting victims. Well, it, it started in um, undergraduate school where I started getting inklings of it. Okay. And again, because of the way I was raised, I never trusted authority. I mean, I never trusted authority. So here I am going through <clears throat> undergraduate psychology at Temple University. And uh, it was pretty intense. And one thing that bothered me about it is the only psych course that I could verify was experimental psychology, where you could actually go into the lab, run these procedures, and watch the behavioral mechanisms roll off reliably. All these others, you had to take their word for it. You know, so here you are reading all this stuff, and then you go to the back of the book, and this struck me as odd too. You go to the back and you look at the references. And this guy got the information from this guy who got the information from this guy who got it from this guy who got it from this guy. <laughs> And, uh, you know, in the entire time, close to 40 years that I've been working on the front lines of, of psychology and psychiatry, I have never seen a researcher, any kind of researcher, come onto the front lines looking for answers. Mm -hmm. now, they wouldn't let them in. You know, they'd say, oh, it's too dangerous or, uh, 
uh, you only can do this kind of stuff. Or, uh, you know, in the prison, they wouldn't let any researcher in. Uh, I never saw a researcher at the state hospital. You know, they had students coming through, but it's almost like before they would let you into these institutions, they had to make sure that you were brainwashed to their way of thinking. You know, this is caused by this. This is what this is. Da, 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 da. And, and what is it? You learn it and you regurgitate it. Um, things started breaking down. Uh, I remember one time where one of the courses in uh, uh, abnormal psych we had where the, the psychologist had us read a um, research report that says that if two crazy people met each other and they both had the same delusion, one, one of them would have to give way. And I'm like, what, why would that be? You know, what, you got two crazy people and why would one of them have to give way to the delusion of the other one? And, and it just stuck in my head, but I had no way to verify any of this stuff that they were teaching us. So I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me. So I logged it away. And probably uh, 20, 25 years later, I was on the second floor of one of the psych units. And uh, here's this old guy walking around. He, he, I hadn't seen him before. And he's, he's carrying on a conversation with somebody. Looked like he was talking to himself. But, uh, you know, I kind of crept up behind him and, and listened to him. It was like a, uh, hearing a one-way telephone conversation where you only could hear the guy talking but you could hear the responses and and the, mm -hmm. the the talk was to these responses so i found that interesting um and i i walked up to him and he spotted me and i said uh, hey i'm jerry i'm the psych for this unit uh you're new i haven't seen you before and i go what, what's your name and he goes uh i'm jesus christ you know and i looked at him and i i'm like click 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 i went no 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 you're not Jesus Christ because I'm Jesus Christ. And I sat there waiting like, okay, what's he going to do? You know? So he kind of, he's thinking about it, thinking about it. And then he looks at me and he goes, okay, we can both be Jesus Christ. And then he, he just strolls off. I went, well, okay, so much for that BS, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I checked into later on, this was years later, I checked into the validity of the research that psychologists do virtually higher than 85% was non-replicable. So in, in short order, it was crap. It could not be replicated. It it. And I saw that yeah. while it was, it couldn't be repeated. And I saw that when I was in the doctoral program, it was like, yeah, publish, publish, publish. It doesn't matter what you publish, as long as you publish. If, if um, a lot of these conditions are created by psychiatrists and psychiatry in order to put them in the DSM so that big pharma can create new psychotropic drugs in order to treat these conditions that were just created. I mean, is mental illness a fraud? I mean, how do they diagnose paranoid schizophrenics who are real? They are real. Uh, you know, they have all these, these, uh, it, it's not that the mental illness isn't real. I mean, it, it's, it's a part of the human continuum, mm -hmm. you know, and we all have facets of paranoid schizophrenia, you know, uh, like a when spectrum. you start, it's it's a spectrum, yeah. um, and 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 these entities, I mean, that that drive it, they hit us all. So, you know, it 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 starts out with where do thoughts come from? Yeah. You know, are they yours? And and uh, Manuel Swedenborg, some three hundred years ago, says no, none of your thoughts are your own. You know, now you're not born with thoughts; they didn't come with you when you were born. All of us have this voice in our head that's constantly ba 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 ba, and so do schizophrenics. Mm -hmm. The difference is the intent. Yeah, you know, what is that voice in your head? Who is that voice in your head? And if you think that's you, then who's listening? <laughs> who's the one that's listening to that constant gibberish that's going on in in your head? And how much of that gibberish is true? Not much of it. In terms of paranoid schizophrenics what differentiates them from you know the general public who hear voices in their heads but it's their own voice you know how 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 do they know the difference you know between well, how does how does psychiatry say you're mad you're going to get locked up indefinitely because you're mad yeah they have a list of uh traits uh you know they 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 call the voices hallucinations 
All right. So, 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 so paranoid schizophrenic is determined by, sorry, is defined by people who who hear voices in their head. Well, that's that that's one of the, one of the characteristics. Symptoms. That's one of the main characteristics. There's the a withdrawal uh, from everybody. There's um, uh, irrational behavior, irrational thoughts, the destructive, self-destructive behavior, uh, suicidal ideation, uh, doing crazy things, saying crazy things. Uh, saying stuff that doesn't make sense, um, talking to themselves or, or carrying on conversations with voices. Uh, they have a whole listing of, of, of traits for mm -hmm. each of these mental disorders. You know, but they, they appear in everybody, but they're, they're in a higher concentration in, in schizophrenics. So, you know, what's key is that people believe and are taught from the time they're born that their thoughts are their own. They're not. Yeah. They come from they come from other places. They they come from dark places. They come from good places. But what you have in your head is a story of your about yourself that you've concocted and it's a series of experiences that you've had in your entire life. And and that voice in your head is constantly reinforcing that. So when you see something that happens in the in the environment, you'll grab that and okay, that that supports my idea of who I am and what I am and what's going on. So each of us have our own stories. Yeah, you know, they're different. Where things got strange was when I was at the state hospital. The it's just um, the early part of your career. The early part of my career. And were you here, specializing? Here, was you specializing in paranoid schizophrenics, or were you seeing all kinds of different people? No, I, I just kept, you know, it's like some big hand every time I tried to escape them because they were very frustrating. They were very aggravating. You know, they, yeah. they were very perplexing. They were very abusive. They, they were not good people. They, they, were, not, they, were, mm. they, were, they were really squirrely. And, and it was like, what the devil is going on with these people? You know, it's like, so it was like bit by bit, little piece by piece. I would get a piece here, a piece there. One of the first things I had to do was figure out how to talk to them. Um, and what they, what happened is is if they thought that you believed like all the other psychologists and psychiatrists did that their voices were hallucinations, they wouldn't tell you anything. So that's uh, the standard explanation of psychiatry for uh, voices in the heads of paranoid schizophrenics that they're just hallucinations created hallucinations. by their own mind. Right. Yeah. Well, due to a chemical brain imbalance, which they've never been able to prove. Matter of fact, it's been disproved. Yeah. And and when the research started coming out. Uh, they tried to hide it. The, the chemical companies, uh, the big pharma tried to hide it. They wouldn't publish it in their journals. They wouldn't let it get out in, in you know, any of the professional journals, uh, especially with the antipsychotic meds, which are very toxic. They're very mm -hmm. They're some of the most dangerous meds used in, in medicine today. Mm -hmm. You know, these antipsychotic meds will, will shrink your brain. They destroy your peripheral nervous system. They cause all kinds of neurological damage. And when that first came out uh, in research, uh, they, they found it with long-term schizophrenics, like in mental hospitals, they would do autopsies on them. And they found that all their brains were shrunk, you know, like walnuts, oh. they just shrunk. So when they, when they published this, all of a sudden the drug companies and psychiatry comes running out screaming, it's not, it's not the meds, it's not the meds, it's the schizophrenia, whatever that is. You know, mm -hmm. it's the schizophrenia germ. It's 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 mm -hmm. the schizophrenia disease, and, and it's mm -hmm. neither a disease or a germ. Is this the way that psychiatrists have learned how to handle paranoid schizophrenics? In the sense that psychiatrists going back a hundred years or more have been the people who deal with the crazy schizophrenics on a day-to-day -day basis, and they've used a multitude of uh, cruel and unusual punishments in order to control people who have this affliction, you know, from torture to torment and straitjackets. And it seems as if these psychotic drugs that they have now are just used as a weapon to silence them, throw them in a the corner and not have to worry about them. Is that what you say? Is well, like, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, now, not to say that those, the antipsychotic drugs that they have work only because they calm the person down. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the only reason. There is no chemical imbalance in their brains. They've never found one. Matter of fact, they've di disproven it over and over again. Yeah. There's no, there's no schizophrenia gene, you know. So it's not genetic. 
but you know the, they have to give the appearance that they know what's going on so yeah. you know do you think they, that they really do know what's going on no, no. this is the they have story. no idea they have no, no idea what's going on none yeah you know but they they act like that i mean they, yeah. their egos are just you know blown all out of proportion but all they're they're just drug pushers for the friggin pharma companies yeah. you know? and their suicide rate is virtually exactly the same as that of schizophrenics which is three to five times higher than the general population what uh, psychiatrists so, psychiatrists okay but isn't that interesting that is <laughs> well I, I, I think mean, there's is a, it stress uh, of the job or is it the you know knowing the fraud that they're committing well, against thought, people yeah, the I crimes that maybe they're involved in you know well, I, th I think it's a, a combination of things. Is is one is they know that these medications that they're dishing out are are potentially harming a lot of their patients. Um, they're they're not curing anybody. These people keep coming back over and over, and that's how the the modern day uh, mental hospitals work. They bring them in, they fill them full of these antipsychotic drugs, which are awful with terrible side effects. I mean, terrible side effects. The voices are ameliorated they're they're kind of lessened they it doesn't make them go away and if it does as soon as they stop taking the drugs the voices come back so it doesn't they don't cure anything so eventually almost all of them go off those drugs and that was one of the things i wondered about at the state hospital too i mean we had uh i was working at a psych rehab center it was a yarborough psychiatric rehab center and we had uh, vocational classes for all these people. You know, they were kind of auto mechanics and janitor and hairdresser and that kind of stuff. Um, they had to go for for six months, I think, on a job before we considered them a success. But what would happen is, and, and this is true for all, almost all schizophrenics, as they started to get to the point where they succeeded, where they were about to get their certificates, they did something that screwed up. You know, they they would sabotage themselves, and it was time after time after time. And one of the most common things they would do, they go off their medications. And I'm going, why are they doing that? So I knew the side effects were awful. So, and I I, I also knew in my gut that they, the schizophrenics, had the answers. You know, psychiatry didn't have any answers. You know, so it it was kind of like, okay, the side effects are awful, but what's worst? You know being psychotic, which which you go down the list of all these, you know, uh, hallucinations where you see monsters coming out of the wall or the, your, your, the walls bleed blood and you, you're afraid that the police are after you or somebody's going to murder you or somebody's looking in the window or somebody's following you. And I mean, it's just hell on earth. I mean, it's, mm. it's bad. It's really bad. Your mind is taken over with paranoia about everything, you know. Uh, you don't know what's real, what's not real. Uh, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's like hell on earth. Now, the side effects of the medications are, are bad. So it's like, okay, which is worse? So every patient who went off their meds when I had my caseload at, at the hospital, I'd give them a couple of questionnaires. I, I'd go, okay, uh, what were the side effects of the antipsychotic drugs you were taking? I'd write them down. Okay, so they wrote them down because they all didn't have the same side effects. So there'd be a handful of side effects, and they were bad stuff, um, sexual dysfunction. Uh, you know, my brain was foggy. I couldn't think straight. I couldn't see straight. My vision was blurred. Um, you know, I had uh, nervous tics, uh, um, and dry mouth, uh, all this whole list of – but. Not all of them had all those side effects. And, and then I'd say, okay, write down, I give them a list of all the, all the symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia, which is about a page and a half out of the DSM. And I said, uh, okay, circle each one of these you've had while you're off your meds. Yeah. And so they would do that. And then I'd take them, I'd look at them both, and I'd give them back to them. And I'd say, which one is worst? Okay, so, so which one of these two bad things was the worst? 100% said the psychotic symptoms were much worse. And then the, then was the $64 question, then why do you keep going off your meds? Mm -hmm. You know, so what they would say before that and what all the other staff would say, well, it's due to the side effects. So now they had the comparison between the side effects and the symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia. And here they're saying, 
the symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia are much worse. My question to them is, then why do you keep going off your meds? You know what their answer was? I don't know. That went on for all seven years. Every time one of them went off their meds, I would ask them, why'd you do it? And and I felt like I was going nuts myself. It's like, you know, you, you keep asking the same answer uh, question, you keep getting the same answer, there's no change. And I'm like, but they have to know the answer at some point. So toward the end of the seven years, there was one gal that was doing really well. Uh, she was about to graduate. She went off her med, sabotaged herself, and we were about to throw her out because that was the third time she'd done it. So we figured, okay, if they can't stay on their meds, they're not going to be able to work, which is pretty much true. Um, and if they can't stay on them here, they're not going to stay on them uh, out in the community. They're not going to make the trouble to go get them and take them and, you know, because their meds are awful. So the mother calls me up and she goes, you can't send her home. I can't handle her. I don't know what to do. You, you got to keep her there. We got to uh, let me come up there and talk to her. Maybe we can uh, talk her some sense into her. And I said, okay, well, you know, come on up. And it was one Friday afternoon. The mother and I were in my office. We brought her in. And both of us are asking the, the patient, you know, you're doing well in your classes. You were making good grades. You, you, this is the third time you did this, went off your meds and you blew your, you know, you got kicked out of class. You couldn't function. You were back there making noises and talking to hallucinations or whatever, you know, and the mother's begging her like, why, why did you do this? Why? And I'm like, yeah, why did you do this? Why? why? And she goes, you won't believe it. I said, well, you know, I've seen some pretty strange stuff since I've been here. I don't think you're going to tell me anything that's going to shock me. I said, well, why do you keep going off your meds? And she said, uh, well, the voices told me to. They told me that the psychiatrist was poisoning me with those meds and that I needed to go off them. Now, th something else clicked. Remember, we talked about the assaults on the psychiatrist earlier? Yeah. Well, yeah. if the voices are telling the patients that the psychiatrists are poisoning them with these meds, then it makes sense that the if they're psychiatry is forcing them to take these meds, they're going to lash out against a psychiatrist for poisoning. The meds in this situation were quietening the voices in the heads of the patients. What they are is major or, tranquilizers. They're major yeah. tranquilizers. Yeah. So, so why did the voices want the patient to stop taking the meds so that they had more control over, over the host? Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. You know, because they, they lose ground like that. So, one thing these voices do is they're constantly pushing for more and more control. Mm. You know, and, and the arguments that you see between schizophrenics, I mean, you go to a mental hospital and you'll hear them just carrying on these volatile arguments with somebody, you know, calling them names, you son of a bitch, da, 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 da. no, no, I'm not going to do that, you know, get out of my head, da, da, da. Uh, they're, they're trying to gain more and more control. So... And they're telling the patient themselves, don't tell anybody about us, because if you do, they're not going to believe you. You know, they're going to take you to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist is going to fill you with drugs, and then they're going to lock you up. Unfortunately, that's what happens. Do you think there's a lot of people in mental institutions that shouldn't be there? I mean, they're there just because you know, it's the only way that society knows how to deal with them, but it's just making their life worse. It's more torment and torture on behalf of the patient. I mean, what was your experience in, in the hospital with dealing with all these patients? I mean, that must have been pretty tough work. Well, yeah, to tell, tell you the truth, at least they had a place to stay. So all when right, Proposition okay. 13 came through here uh, in the United States from California, it was a, a, a tax rebellion back in the 70s where the, the Californians are going, you're taxing us to death and we're sick of it and, and you know, no more, you know, so they cut it out. So they started uh, chopping off their state hospitals and then making up these, this bull crap that, oh, these guys will be better off in a normal population out on the street with somebody else taking care of them. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to uptick the mental health centers, fund them better, and they can get their meds from the mental health center. But they weren't even taking them in the state hospitals where they were being handed to them. They're not going to go out of their way to go to a mental health center and, and try to find transportation. Most of them don't have transportation to go to a mental health center. And then they have these things dished out, and, and they're just going to give them a, a month's prescription. They're not going to take these things. So now you've got the streets of San Francisco and, and all these other major cities filled with mentally ill people. They're the people that are, are on the sidewalk sleeping out in the gutters and stuff. 
those are the people who were in the state hospitals. You know, we had something like then, that in the UK. Is that Margaret Thatcher, when she was prime minister, she brought in something similar, which was called care in the community, where she emptied <laughs> all the asylums, emptied the the hospitals, and you know the people who needed the care and attention from uh, you know the, the medical institutions were just thrown out onto the street, and they become well, a lot of the homeless. It happened in the whole Western world. So it's like, okay, yeah. this will be cheaper, but it's not cheaper because the ones who were dangerous ended up in the state prison. So the state prisons and your prisons are now mm. the state hospitals where they used to be. Uh, and the cost of keeping a, a mentally ill guy in the prisons is, is much higher than it was in the state hospital because you have to have the security, you know, you have to watch them closer. You have to, you know, uh, it's much higher. The cost is much higher. And then you have all these crazy guys in the prisons where they don't give them any psychotic meds there unless they're causing problems. Right. So what the gangsters are doing there is they're taking the meds from some of these guys and they're telling them, hey, this guy in this rival gang, is is he's he's going to kill you. He's, he's after you. You better go get him first. They give him a weapon. They say, yeah, here, go get that guy. Now, so the crazy guy goes over and stabs the guy and he's like their torpedo. Wow. So these guys get more upset, more hardened, more violent in the prisons. And and then when their term runs out, they give them two weeks worth of antipsychotic meds, throw them out on the street with $50 and say, when you run out of meds, go to the nearest emergency room, which is where I spent the last 10 years of my career working psych crisis in the emergency rooms. So here's these guys the prisons are sending in. Hey, I'm out of my meds. The voices are telling me to kill myself. What do I do? So it's like, okay, so now you have to hook them up with the mental health center. You hook them up with the mental health center. They give them the meds. They go off the meds. The, they, the same thing happens. And this whole giant merry-go-round just keeps spinning and spinning around and around. They go off their meds. They put them on their meds. They psychiatrically hospitalize them. They charge the insurance companies tens of thousands of dollars for all this, for the drugs, for the hospitalization. They kick them out. And it just goes round and round. It's like the giant fleecing of society by... By Do you think it's just money? Pharma? Do you think it's, it's mostly just, money. It, it's, yeah, there's it's no mostly. higher agenda going on in terms of like creating chaos within society and well, you know, it, all those it, things to destabilize our civilization, you know? Well, it does do that. You know, yeah. it, it does do that. I'm not sure they're doing that on purpose, but yeah. it is happening. I've seen them release people from the state prison that I knew within six months they were going to kill somebody. Mm. You know, that's how bad off they were, but they're sentenced over. You know, and then on top of that, you know, so releasing these guys every day, you know, scores of them every day they're releasing out in the community. But if one guy escapes from the prison who's a robber or murderer or something, and they announce it on the news, oh, there's a murderer loose in the neighborhood. You know, everybody close their doors and get your guns out, you know, and, and everybody's panicking and like, oh, did they catch him yet? Did they catch him yet? They're totally unaware that they're letting scores of them out every, <laughs> every day, day into the community, <laughs> yeah. you know. And in worse shape than they ever went in. There is virtually no rehabilitation in the prisons at all. Virtually it's none. Just, it's just punishment, isn't it? In it's punishment. Prisons. And Skinner yeah. showed 80 years ago that punishment doesn't work. It just yeah. suppresses the behavior below baseline as long as that punishing stimulus is there. So as long as you got the cop with the club over your head, you're yeah. going to behave. But as soon as he goes away, what happens is the behavior swings up past baseline higher as if to catch up with the time lost and then goes back down the baseline again. So punishment does not work. Scientifically, it does not work. And our institutions, that's what they're doing. It's, it's Do you more think like these guys as well, thing. once they're released, they're so institutionalized that the only place that they think they can have any structure or, or control over what's going on in the head is back in prison Except, or yeah. mental hospital. And so they go and commit a crime in order for their voices to be able to go and endure this Torture, well, I, I've, torment, I've, pain, and suffering. I've I've heard that many times. You know, mm. they they come out. They've been there ten years, and they, here's cell phones. And what's a cell phone? And 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 what's all this new stuff? And what is this car? And and what they run on electricity? And you know, it's like they're they're not. They've been out of it. It's like you've been on a yeah. desert island for ten years. You know, and they can watch some television in in there, but it's like they're totally not suited. And, and all the rehabilitation programs, they've, they've slowly destroyed them. I mean, they used to give them training. 
you know, okay, let's become a gardener or become a, a cosmetologist or, or become a carpenter. And they'd have these classes in there. But slowly they, they've taken them, you know, time after time because the states are keep, you know, they, they're, they have this, uh, what is it, mandatory sentencing laws here. They had it for marijuana for a long time. You get caught with a, you know, half ounce of marijuana, you're going to prison for this much time. You know, and they throw in these guys in there and, and the prisons are full to overflowing. You know, they're full to overflowing. They, there's no room in there. The, the rooms that were designed for two people, they got four people in there. Uh, they're, they're overcrowded to the max and there's virtually no rehabilitation going on in there at all. So they're, they're a plague on society, if, if anything. Yeah. The only people that should be in there are the violent ones that they can't control that, that that danger to society. That they yeah. danger to society. Uh, so okay, we've we've gone off a little bit in, in terms to um, politics, really, and uh, you know the politics of prisons and stuff like that. But let's move it back towards schizophrenics that you were dealing with in the hospital and the discoveries you began to make into the voices and what you were uncovering uh, with that with that research and how you were dealing with it. Well, the the, the first thing I noticed when I got to the state hospital was. Nobody was curious about what these voices were telling these people. You know, they knew that the voices were driving their behavior. You know, they could see it. They, they could see them arguing with them. Uh, they, could, they could say the voices are telling me to kill myself. I mean, they could see it. They, they could see that these voices were driving their behavior. But not a single one of them was interested in what these voices were telling these people. You know? mm -hmm. So I started asking them, well, what are the voices? What are they telling you? And uh, what do you think they are and if they if they sensed that i thought they were hallucinations if they they would just shut up they wouldn't tell me anything you know so at one point when i realized that i said well let's give them the benefit of the doubt it's their heads what's let's find out what's going on in their heads and i started asking questions about the voices and and they one guy tell me a little thing here and another one there and and i'd, I'd collect up all these little things that they're telling me about the voices and when the i got the next guy I'd say, well, I know this and this and this about the voices. What else can you tell me? So here comes this this series of things that uh, I would check out with each different schizophrenic. So if one schizophrenic told me, well, the voices tell me this, then I'd ask the next in line, do you also hear this? And then patterns started emerging, which was really interesting because hallucinations don't have patterns. They're, they're random. Mm. So what were the patterns? I mean, what, what what was it that kept reoccurring in order for you to, well, you know, your your attention to be peaked enough to start okay. asking deep questions? Here, now, now this is after uh, this is after forty years of studying the voices. So here here are the patterns that that these voices run, and this is this is after pretty much forty years in the field. They're negative. They're always negative. They're not positive. They're always telling the guy something bad about himself or every somebody else. Uh, that's their most common consistent trait. They're derogatory, insulting, abusive, and destructive. Uh, they may try to convince the person that they're positive helpers, that they're trying to help them out. Uh, sometimes they'll say, um, we're Jesus or we're, we're spirits. We have powers that uh, we can help you with. Uh, but you know, invariably, they're trying to get the person's trust that they are somebody that can help them or they're a friend, and then they slowly turn on them. They're anti-religious. I noticed that in the state hospital right away. You know, it, it came to a uh, parent one day when I noticed that when the chaplain was having um, ice cream socials, all the schizophrenics on my ward stayed on the ward. They didn't go down to the ice cream social. Cake and ice cream were hard to come by in that place. Mm. So I'd ask him, well, why, why aren't you down with the other guys with the chaplain, uh, the ice cream? So oh, I don't, I don't like chaplains. I don't like the Bible. I, there, there is no God. Uh, da, da, da. They, and, and the ones I started asking questions about that and, you know, asked them, well, have you ever gone to church? And they go, yeah. Well, what did the voices do when you went to church? Well, it broke down into three categories. If the voices were weak, when they, when they went to church, the voices would shut up. If they were medium strength, and they went in there and the preacher started talking. The voices would get louder and drown them out. So they, the person couldn't hear what the voices were saying. And they'd say stuff like, um, uh, Jesus couldn't even help himself. What makes you think he's going to help you? This is stuff that the voices are commonly telling these people. Oh, this is a bunch of crap. Uh, one of the biggest tricks they do is uh, if you read the Bible, the voices will tell them, well, you got to read it from cover to cover. 
And then when they get to the point where this guy begat that guy, begat that guy, begat, and that goes on for pages and pages, the voices come back and go, see, it's a bunch of crap. Why are you wasting your time with that? Look at this crap. Mm -hmm. you know, but if the voices are real strong and the guy tries to go in, they'll jump up and they'll run out of that church. So that, that implies that um, you're dealing with demons or entities from another realm. If the Bible or, you know, religious texts or even prayer could have some effect over over these voices. I mean, that takes well, it as far away from psychiatry's explanation as you could possibly go, doesn't it? Yes, it sure does. And, yeah. and you go, you wouldn't expect a hallucination to have any kind of reaction to religiosity. Yeah. You know, why would why would a hallucination care about that? Yeah. Uh, but one, one of the things that really struck me strange is I started having patients come in saying when they repeated the 23rd Psalm, the voices went nuts. You know, it, one, two, two or three of them told me it was like throwing worms onto a hot frying pan. That's how why, the voices reacted to the 23rd think, Psalm. Why do you think the 23rd Psalm would have such an effect i mean because that's got that great line isn't it you know even though i walk through the valley of the shadows Shadow of death, death i will fear, I will fear, no, fear evil. no evil for and, you and that's it me. right there that's yeah, it right yeah. there because these things want the patient to fear them yeah. because that they what they do is they're they're energetic parasites they mm. inject thoughts into their minds that are negative fearful anxious provoking and then they feed off of that negative emotional energy so mm -hmm. a pattern that you'll find with schizophrenics, and you know, don't take my word for it, it's out there. Just go look. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's working with schizophrenics, after the voices attack, they are completely drained. They don't ha yeah. have any energy. A lot of them can't even get out of bed. And I thought for years that this was due to the anxiety provoked by these nasty voices telling them to kill themselves or kill other people or do this kind of stuff. Or, you know. And, and then one day, a situation happened in the prison where a fella who had snitched off the gangs was put into the jail for the prison. So I, I, I always found myself over the worst units, the most violent ones, which was okay with me because I was an adrenaline junkie. <laughs> but uh, he was locked in the, in the cell with a flaming, florid psychotic who was unmedicated. And the gangsters were after the first guy because he had snitched off a gang, uh, a drug deal. So they were trying to kill him. They wanted him dead so bad that they actually got guys that got in trouble so they could get thrown into the central detention unit so they would have a chance to kill this guy. So he's already been stabbed once. He was in there for protective custody. So there were, there were two room cells, and the guy that they put in with him was a florid psychotic, unmedicated. And at, at 3 in the morning, he's standing above this guy's bed just staring down at him. <laughs> You know, just staring at him, he wakes up and here's this guy staring at him, yeah. you know, who's who's pacing the cell and, and speaking to voices and acting weird and it's totally out of it. So uh, I go to my office first thing in the morning and here's a letter from that guy, the guy who snitched off the drug uh, cartels in, in the prison saying, you, you got to do something with this guy. He's, he's driving me nuts. So I got to get out of here. And then there was a uh, also a, a memo from the captain of the central detention unit saying you need to come down and take a look at this psychotic guy in the, in the cell with this guy so they were both in the same cell it, it was it was a perfect experimental situation so they were under the same conditions with the same staff with the same food i mean everything else was negated except for their their two conditions mm -hmm. and uh i went over to you know look at them and i was watching them as they come up the step uh i talked to the guy who uh, the gangsters were trying to kill first. And uh, he told me this guy's pacing the say he's crazy. He's talking to himself. He's saying nonsensical things. He's threatening me. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, you know, I can't, I can't handle this. Um, and the gangsters were threatening him also. They were throwing these notes under his door saying, we're here. As soon as we get a chance, we're, you're dead. You know, we're here. We're, 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 we're in, the, in the cells right across from you. So, Apparently, it was a big drug deal, and they were pissed. They wanted this guy mm. taken out. They'd already stabbed him once, which is why they put him in protective custody. So I was thinking yeah. he was a snitch. So, mm. so I was thinking that uh, the reason that schizophrenics were drained after the voices attacked is because it was so negative and so intense and so awful. Yeah. Um, but if that were the case, 
this guy who the gangsters were trying to kill should also be drained. Yeah. You know, because he, outside of war, it doesn't get any worse than that. Locked yeah. in a tiny cell with a flaming schizophrenic who probably hurt somebody in the past with gangsters outside your door threatening to kill you if you come out. It doesn't get worse than that. Mm. Uh, so I, got, I, I, I looked at him and watched him as he came up the steps, and he had plenty of energy. He just bounded up the steps. He didn't even have to use the guardrails. He came in. He was nervous. He was agitated. Uh, he was he was paranoid. But he had plenty of energy. He wasn't drained. You know, he was scared and and somewhat depressed. But he wasn't wiped out. I mean, he he his flow of speech was coherent. It was quick. It was energetic. You know, he had plenty of energy. So sent him back and brought up the schizophrenic guy, and he could barely make it up the steps. He was grabbing on the handrail. He was struggling to get up the steps. He came in. He slouched down in the chair, and he's like, no energy. He was depressed. Um, and is this due to the episode that has happened in terms of he'd had a, a, a psychic parasitical attack, and they had created all this negative energy, and that's the food for them to feed from? Is that, is that what you Well, so that knocked them? out my th- – yep. That's where it came down to, because for years I thought it was the anxiety uh-huh. that the, of, of what the voices were telling him, because they never told him anything good. You know, kill mm. yourself, kill somebody else. Uh, this guy's after you. I mean, it's nothing good. Um, but in, in this case, this other guy should have been drained also, but he wasn't. Yeah. So yeah. I I left that uh, I left the central detention unit that thought going My, that theory's wrong. Yeah. That theory's wrong. Something else is going on. Do you remember here. that as well quite, quite yeah, vividly? Yep. Yeah, and yeah. I, I didn't know what was going on, but I knew it wasn't the anxiety. So again, mm-hmm. I started asking them questions. And you know, it was like, after the voices attack, are you drained? Yes. Almost, it was like 100%. Almost every single one would say, after the voices attack, I was drained. So what I did is I got a, a scale, 1 to 10. How much energy do you have before the voices attack? How much energy do you have after the voices attack? So I, I give it to them, and there was a, a marked difference between the two. So they they I, come I, in waves with the attacks, come in waves. It's not consistent 24-7. Well, yeah. some, with when some they of need it to is. feed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some so, is, with yeah, some of them it is. It is consistent, and they're drained all the time. You know, they're yeah. hearing the voices 24 hours a day. With others, they come in spurts. Um you know, they come in when something goes wrong. They're right there to feed on it, to, to, to you know, flame it up. Uh, they come after sunset, which is interesting. Um, mm. They get louder after sunset. They get louder about three in the morning. It's like vampires, isn't it? Literally, when the sunlight comes up, it burns and kills them. You know, there's, I think right. there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of truth in the fiction of Dracula with this story. Yes, you know? yes. Yeah. I, I, I think that's where probably the subconscious came from with Dracula. Yeah. With, because yeah. these things are feeding... Not only off them, but all of us. Yeah. You know, every yeah. time you you know you can do the strength testing stuff. I think we talked about that, right? Mm-hmm. Where where you get a negative thought in your head and and try to hold your arm up and it, it won't stay. Mm. You know, so they're being drained and uh, they didn't they don't know it. So you you ask them. Uh, and I started asking them again because I knew they had the answer somewhere. You yeah, know, yeah. And, and I didn't get any answers in school. I didn't get any answers in undergraduate. I didn't get any answers in master's program. I didn't get any answers in the doctoral program. They didn't have any answers. They had. Has this become an obsession for you in your career at the time? Is this something that you were? Well, you were it, it kind of was, and it, you know, and I'd get sick of it. You know, like yeah. it, it's like having this giant puzzle. Yeah. You know, and you're working on it for years, and and yeah. you got sections of it together, but you can't find the rest, and you can't find the other pieces, and you go well. There are no other pieces. I quit, and mm-hmm. and then I walk away, and I go. I don't want to deal with psychotics anymore, and I'll go deal with drug addicts. And then it's like some big hand went out and grabbed me again. Okay, you spent your time with the drug addicts. Get back in here with the psychotics. And the next job would open up, and there they would be again. Oh, and I pick up right where I left off because there was nothing yeah. else to do, mm-hmm. you know, other than investigate this. Mm-hmm. So it, it was clear that they were being drained, and you'd ask them. Uh, Okay, you know, every time that voices come, you're drained. You know, you don't have any energy after they leave. Where's your energy going? You know what their answer was? I don't know. And and then I'd say, well, if you if you have a raging fire in front of you and you put your hand in that fire, and every time you get you stick your hand in the fire, you get burned. Mm-hmm. What's burning you? Yeah. You know, the fire. They know that. And I'd say, well, okay, 
if if you've heard the voices 10,000 times over 20 years and every time you heard the voices your energy level drops to zero where's your energy what going could it be? yeah what could it be and they'd go i don't know they were being blocked from seeing that they couldn't make that correlation and i'm like that's odd because they could make the fire correlation they could make other correlations but they couldn't make that one mm. you know so the question became what is blocking them from understanding this? You know, it's pretty clear they can understand these others, but they can't understand that one. There's something blocking it. So I don't. We started off with the uh, um, the traits. You want to go back to the traits? Or, sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anti-religious. I mean, they they were they don't want anything to do with religion. The Bible preachers. They hate preachers. Um, they don't want the guy going to church. They don't want him reading the Bible, and why would a hallucination do that? Mm -hmm. Now, and, and you guys who are working with schizophrenic, check it out yourself. I mean, th all this is right in your face. It's right in your friggin' face. Just open your eyes and look at it. If they're running patterns, they cannot be hallucinations, as psychiatry is telling you. That's a fable. It's more of their bunk. Mm -hmm. Now, take these medicines. Uh, well, we're making a fortune off of these. Just keep telling there is no other treatment. Uh, it all has to be drugs. So I mean the political implica the political implications of of what would happen if they did accept what the voices could possibly be is huge. I mean maybe there is yeah. a reason for them to say no 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 we we don't want to go down that route. Well yeah, but you know if you look at both psychiatry and psychology there's there's no spirituality to it at all. No. You know it's completely devoid of any kind of spirituality. Well while, while I was in graduate school i had to read other books just to feed my soul it was like mm -hmm. being in the sahara desert it was all the ego stuff you well, know, it was the complete... for me is it, what's, what's interesting for me is that psychiatry is a relatively modern invention yeah? freud being the great gatekeeper of uh, the yeah, about days. 100 150 years maybe something like yeah. that so, yeah. so previous to um the introduction of psychiatry to this realm it's that the Catholic Church, generally speaking, would deal with people like this and say they were possessed by z demons and and have exorcisms. You know, they would have spiritual exorcisms, which would cast out, you know, the the demons from these people, like Jesus did in his ministry yeah. twenty five times. You know, that yeah, was right, cast so, out. Um, so, so isn't so that it strange? If, yeah, it seems as if the with the decline of the influence of the church and the rise in the influence of psychiatry is that the problem isn't being resolved anymore as it was spiritually it's now just being used you know a chemical cautious is being used to knock these people out and not solve the problem i mean do you think right. that's part of the issue here is it on a, oh. a meta level yeah it's a it's a big part of the issue well all you know they're they're performing chemical lobotomies on these people mm -hmm. you know they're they're filling them full of drugs it's a control issue yeah. you know they're not trying to help these people get better. They're just drugging them down. Mm. And, and they're, they're being taught in the, in the medical schools and psychiatry that there is no other solution. You know, there is no other solution because they're not looking for one. You look at the funding that the National Institute of Mental Health has, has given for psychiatric research on, in schizophrenia. They've, they've manipulated the numbers to where their funding is now down in the dumps. They do not want an answer. They're making the psychiatrists and big farmer are making trillions of dollars. I think it's two hundred and thirty four billion dollars a year mm -hmm. between their psychiatric services and these toxic medications they're dishing out. They're after the money and control. They're not after people getting better. That's right across the board. It's not just psychiatry, is it? It's also, you know, with, with other areas of big pharma and cancer and, you know, COVID. They don't right. want people being cured because, you know, that's, that's the, what is it? The first yeah. disaster of, um, of medicine is someone dying. The set, second disaster is someone being cured, you know, because they're no right. longer a, um, a, a consumer of their product anymore. Exactly. They? they don't make money with them being cured. And schizophrenics are perfect. Oh, you got to yeah. take these drugs for the rest of your life. That's what they're told. Oh, mm -hmm. you have a a uh, chemical brain imbalance, which, you know, they're, they're totally clueless. That's what they've been taught in graduate school. They don't, they don't question anything mm -hmm. and they're not allowed to. I remember when I was in a doctoral program after seven years in the, uh, uh, on the front lines, I go, Hey, well, wait a minute. It doesn't work like that. It, it works like this. This is what, Oh, don't you ask, don't you, don't you question me? 
You know, well, we're, we're told, we're, aren't we, to trust the science, but yet there is no science to support. There is no science. <laughs> no. The argument. No. There's no evidence, is there? You know, it's no, just trust no me, science. I'm a doctor, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Yeah. And, and a quasi doctor in, in, in this case. Um, mm. So, you know, these voices, they, they foster and create negative emotion. Okay. So they do to us what we do to cows. You know, they put them out in the field, they, they eat the grass, uh, they bring them in. They isolate them and they milk them. And that's exactly what these schizophrenic voices do to the schizophrenics. Mm. You know, they generate the, the energy. They can't produce their own energy. They can't produce their own emotional energy, just like we can't produce our own milk. So they have to drain it from these people. And it's not mm. just the schizophrenics that are being drained. They're like the milk cows for these things, but they're hitting all of us. And you know yourself, I mean, you can walk down the street and all of a sudden here comes this horrible thought to barges into your head out of nowhere. Well, why don't you just, you know, beat the crap out of that guy? Yeah. Then you go, well, where'd that come from? Or, or why don't you just, you know, hit, hit him in the head with a metal bar? And it's something you would never do. You wouldn't even consider on your own. But just the thought of it upsets you. Yeah. Now, where did that thought come from? Mm -hmm. so, so here you are looking at the thoughts again. So they're, it's like they're, a thought stream, isn't it? It's like a, it's a, a river thought of thoughts. Stream. And, it's a river yeah. of thought. And they don't ever ask where that river of thought comes from. A lot of it comes from your learning. You know, what you've learned, it, it, it's like your story, your experiences with life. But here's all this other stuff coming in from all these other sources. Also, you are the one who's back there listening to all this. Mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're not that voice in your head that is constantly so you telling choose... you this. Do you choose what thoughts to uh, entertain, to accept, yes. to believe, to act upon? Right. And right. It becomes a, 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 a free will choice? You know? Well, it, it, you, it, it's a free will choice at that point if you realize yeah. that you're the chooser. Yeah. yeah but they're not, they're not teaching that. They're saying these thoughts are your own. They belong to mm -hmm. you. You know, from the time you were able to think, those are your thoughts. You, know, you own them. That's not the case. Because that's Again, one of the goals of meditation and prayer, isn't it, is to empty your mind of thoughts. Right, right. And it takes so, years to be able to achieve that enlightened goal because, you know, the river of thought has been damned, as it were. Yeah, it, it is. And, and you realize when you start, if you just sit there and you go, I'm going to wait for my next thought to come, they don't mm -hmm. come. You know, you can sit there and wait, wait, it's not thought. Then you start getting images. So it's like whatever this voices in there it wants control just mm -hmm. like it wants control with the schizophrenics you know you try to control it it doesn't like it but you have this other side there which is feeling and intuition it's that it's that listener in your head that listens to these thoughts and notice how many of those thoughts are lies oh you have to worry about this or what's going to happen here or or a, a vast number of it is just nonsense it's, it's yeah. just nonsense that you're listening to part of you who's listening that part that is you is, is taking advantage of, of. So it's like, how many times have you done something that you didn't really want to do because that voice in your head is telling you that you need to do it? In the sense that um, it, this, the voices, the entities, whatever it is that's doing this, is um, trying to influence your thought stream with negative thought patterns in order to be able to feed from them, which is why they are anti-religious in a sense, because religion and spirituality generally create positive thoughts and positive right. thought streams which would drown out and extinguish the negative ones is that where this yep. Yep. competition that's exactly, as it were yep, comes that's from? exactly right you yeah. know so you're you're the chooser you yeah. know so what happens with schizophrenics is they get unbalanced and they start listening to the negative so yeah. it's like it's like at a certain point you start losing control with us, a, a negative thought comes in our head, hey, smack that guy upside the head. You know, well, I'm not going to do that. You know, where'd that thought come from? And you just go, well, get out of my head. You know, and you don't do it. But the schizophrenics, they, they're constantly being bombarded by these thoughts. And these thoughts are talking back to them just like your thoughts in your head are also. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, do this, do that. Do, you ask do them. Do they talk like, to them in the same voice as your voice? Is it? Is it? The same yeah, that's one sound, thing that's really the same strange. Accent, you know, or is it a different voice? You know, there was one time, uh, and this was at the state hospital, where I mean, there's a long story behind it, where I actually prayed to hear these things so I could sense what they were like, because wow. I'd never heard them myself. Yeah. And uh, 
they came on, they tried to kill me in, in a certain situation. I mean, they were telling me to do things to where if I did them, I knew I wouldn't survive. But what surprised me is that these voices sounded just like all the other thoughts that go through my head, all the other thousands of thoughts that go through my head every day. But the intent was way different. Mm. There was no change in uh, tenor or, or bass or uh, inflection or anything. It sounded just like all the rest of my thoughts. Yeah. But the intent was far different from anything that I would do. Mm -hmm. So it makes it very difficult to pick these things out. You know, especially if you were hearing negative thoughts all your life, you know, it's like, it's just this background noise constantly. Well, I like the idea of um, calling them psychic parasites um, because you know, there's a lot of research at the moment regarding, you know, how much, how dangerous physical parasites are, you know, maybe connected to COVID and cancer and other things, amazing area of research, which led me to you in the first place, but that's another conversation for another time. But, um, one of the things that really blew my mind when I was looking into the parasitic world was we heard of Toxoplasmosis gondii, which is like a specific parasite which uh, lives in the belly of a cat. Right? But mm. in order for it to sexually reproduce, uh, it, the cat puts it out through its feces and then rats will eat the feces. And the parasite will be able to um, inf change the chemical structure of the, of the rat brain in order for it to be attracted to cat urine which normally it's repelled by it because it's a dangerous thing for the rat but mm -hmm. once the toxoplasmosis gondii parasite has entered into the rat voices in the head of the rat tell it to be attracted to the cat urine which is extremely risky which leads to cats catching rats and eating them putting the parasite back into the belly of the cat like a cycle and we can be infected with toxoplasmosis gondii so i'm wondering if you know there is a, a connection between well the, uh, uh, andrew wheel says that, are, are these are these psychic ones you know yeah andrew kaufman says there is and he's he's really? a he's kind of like a uh outer fringe psychiatrist one of the few that i keep contact with <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah he said there is a, a, a relationship between physical parasites and mental parasites but wow. the, the, the voices are the just like they're just like you said you know yeah. it's it's like you throw blood in in the ocean and it attracts sharks yeah you know? so this negative thought stream attracts more negativity what what you have is a split now when that's probably the only thing that uh you know, psychiatry got right. Schizophrenia means split mind. Yeah. So what you have is the original personality that was there. And I then see. you have these voices who are trying to take over that personality. And I don't know how many times the I've had patients ask the voices, who are you? Mm. And they would say, we are you. We are we legion. are you. <laughs> so they want you to yeah. think that you are them. And and what we're taught from the time we were were children is that all thoughts in our head are ours. So when these guys jump in there and they start telling you, well, you know, skin that cat or poison that cat or torture that dog or, you know, you think that's you doing it. Yeah. So we all think that mm -hmm. our thoughts are ours. You know, the first mm -hmm. thing that has to be done is you have to realize that you're the listener of these thoughts. You know, you're the one who's listening to this constant garbage that is talking in your head. You're the one that's really picking which idea, thoughts to attend it? to and, and yeah. which thoughts to attend to and which thoughts to act upon. You know, So most of those thoughts are lies. And most mm -hmm. of the things that schizophrenics are told by their voices, virtually all of them are lies. So once they realize that, that these things are liars, it, it they start losing their grip. You know? In order for a lie to have any substance, you have to believe it. If you don't mm. believe it any longer, it vanishes. Now, the truth will stay. You know, the truth will be retained. Like the voices are entities. That is the truth. Whether psychiatry acknowledges it or not, it's still the truth. You know, it may take them another 200 years to, dis to discover that at the rate they're going. But that's the truth. It's not going anywhere. It's not going to change. Mm -hmm. you know? But the lies that are told schizophrenics, that's where the That's a Lie program comes in on our website. Um, once you start using that, 
and you realize that they're lies and you call it a lie, that destroys their grip. You know, because you have to believe the lie to, for it to have a effect upon you. And it, 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 whether it's the truth or the lie, a, a bad, they want these negative thoughts to be acted upon to generate that negative emotional energy. And it's just as easy for them to tell you a lie to generate that, like, oh, the cops are after you, or, or these gangsters are trying to kill you, or, you know, the, the, the prison is full of paranoia. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's a very paranoid place. What do you think they are? I mean, what's your best guess or your best description of what these voices are? Well, they're they're negative entities. They're around us all the time. Well, in they're what attractive. Realm? Well, they're they're around you right now. In, in an alternate um, universe, uh, different well, it, it is it, um, it is an is alternate. It the, you know the the infinite unconscious that the, the other side of the mind that you access when you do hypnosis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, what would you what would you describe? Well, how would you describe them? Well, they you know they're kind of like evil ghost yeah you know they're they're in another dimension but that dimension interacts with ours so Do you think you look at to be humans that, that lived on earth that uh, well I, I think didn't a, go to heaven <laughs> you know, I think I a know. lot of them a lot of them were yeah. you know that they were evil nasty thing that that came back or never left this dimension they never left this planet you know they're still okay. here roaming around what's what's interesting is that uh, and I started experimenting with this later on when I was doing therapy, is that if you imagine, uh, one of the things I needed to do when I was working in the emergency rooms, okay, they didn't want you doing any kind of therapy in there. They wanted you to either put the person into the psych hospital or get him out of the emergency room or send him to a, somewhere else, just get him out of there because the doctors had no idea how to deal with these guys or what to do with them. Uh, was, that your job? was that your job to that was, process that was my job. the psych emergency? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So they'd come in the ER and, and the, we'd make the decision. You either put him in the hospital or send him to the mental health center, release him to his family. Is he going to kill himself? Uh, is he suicidal? Is, you know, all, all those kind of things. And a lot of times they'd come in saying they were, especially in the winter when the weather was bad, they'd come in going, I'm going to kill myself because they wanted to get out of the cold weather. So that became a pain. But the ones that came in who were psychotic, who didn't need to be hospitalized, I'd like to give them information that would help them when they got out and to about realize your, that these, about your discovery about the voices. Right, right. But I had yeah. to be very careful that they of didn't course. go back and tell psychiatry or tell yeah. their family. So, so I had to be very careful about what I were giving them. Uh, and in order to do that, before they were medicated, the voices were a lot of times so loud you had to get through them first and the voices didn't like what I was telling these people. So they would get louder and they would, they would run a certain progression. They would, they would first tell them this guy's crazy. He's stupid. Don't listen to anything he has to say. You know, he's nuts. Uh, if they stayed there, you know, cause I, I would tell them what, some of what I knew about the voices and they would go, well, Hey, wait a second. This guy's different than the other psychs. He, he knows <laughs> something. And yep. I want to know what it is. So they stay around. So then the voices would say, okay, get out of there. Get get out of his office. Escape the emergency room. Run. Go 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 to the bathroom. Just get out. Uh, and in the prison, the third thing they would say is attacking. And that would roll off like it was like a fixed action pattern almost. Um, so what I noticed on that, and, and I would tell these guys that the certain specific ones when I was going to tell them, they don't want the people to know that they're parasites. That's the last thing they want them to know. So if you had a parasite on your arm, a big leech or something, you know, you're looking down at it. You're not going to let it stay there. You're going to the do success something of about tapeworm. it. A tapeworm yeah. can live with you for years. And for the reason being is that it doesn't go detected. It doesn't, you don't know you've got it and it uses camouflage and concealment to hide. And, and in, that's the exact the same. That's yeah. the exact same thing these things do. They yeah. camouflage themselves in your mind. It's like a tiger in the jungle and that jungle of thought in there. And they come out at times and they inject all these negative thoughts in there and they inflame everything. And if they're fought, if they're caught, they don't like it. You mm -hmm. know, and there were several times where the voices would tell the patient, uh, hey, he knows about us, or hey, the jig's up, or he's he he got us, and they're <laughs> shocked. You know, they're yeah. shocked that, that um, no. So is, is that is that one of the is that one of the remedies um, for people who are uh, suffering with this affliction? Is that once they become aware 
that the voices are not theirs, not in their head. They're actually parasites. Uh, right. Like any other parasite can be evicted as much as they have uh, tried to take possession. Is that one of the key remedies? That's one that of the key things. They have, yep, yeah. they have to understand that those thoughts are not theirs. They don't belong to them. Yeah. They belong to another entity, and that entity is a parasite. It feeds off the negative emotional energy that it injects the, those thoughts into their minds. And one, one thing that's real strange, too, is they have access to all your thoughts, all the patient's mm. thoughts. They have all the negative things they've ever done. It can go in there, and it can pull them up and bring them to consciousness and rub it in their face. You know, mm. so... You that's know, dark, man. It's, it's <laughs> real we, dark. Where, where and, they, and, because just if we... I'm drawn back to um, the toxoplasmosis uh, Gandhi parasite, which is just a single cell parasite. It's just a single cell, but yet it has the ability to go into the, the mind of the rat and change its behavior. How is a single cell parasite? Where does the, what's the mechanism for that to be able to get inside the mind of a rat to control its behavior? So it, for me, it's like, okay, well, these voices have got access to memory. How that, yes. I mean, Where's, where do the memory banks? I mean, is that like the Ashkarkic records where everything that's ever happened and everything that ever will happen is stored in a memory bank and that's available for, you know, yourself? Well, it's, and, yeah, it, it's your it's personal memory, your personal memory bank. Yeah. And, and some of the darkest, I mean, I, I've seen this twice, is where uh, an abused woman, I mean, just tortured by a father or a husband or something for years and years and years. Okay, they started, uh, uh, the guy finally died, and here they're at the funeral, and here's the, the, the guy's body up there, and then all of a sudden they hear this voice in their head that sounds just like the dead, dead guy yeah. who's been torturing them all their lives, and it comes back and it says, you're not rid of me yet. Oh, you, know, you remember when we did this thing and that thing and this thing and that thing, you know, which is Nobody knows about that stuff except them and the yeah. dead guy. So here they've convinced the victim that they're not dead. That guy isn't dead. He's now plaguing them from beyond the grave. But do you think there's a possibility that the entity that was plaguing them in the physical world actually just jumped host? You know, so it, it wasn't actually her father, you know, abusing her or whatever it is. It was, it was the, the entity that had possessed that human host that had hopped you know, hopped over to a new host because did these entities actually well, die? That's, a, that's with an interesting the host idea. When the host dies? Yeah. I, 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 I don't know. Um, it's quite possibly mm. because it, it, you know, here they are pulling out all this bad stuff that, you know, like they might have raped the, the woman or something. You know, hey, man, remember when I raped you and beat you and da, da, da. who else would know that, you know, mm. besides the dead guy? And then that voice is in their head pulling up all this stuff. I've had other patients that one guy owed like a dime to somebody years ago. And here's the voice saying, you didn't pay that guy the dime. You didn't pay him his dime. <laughs> and and then there's, I've heard this a couple of times too, where the voices say, if you poke out your eye, we'll leave you alone. We'll go. You know, we won't bother you anymore. The guy pokes out his eye and the voices come back laughing at him. Like, see how stupid you are? You know, I have a question well, about, um, you know, it's suicide, which you talked about yeah. earlier, that paranoid schizophrenics have a much higher incidence of suicide. Now, the question is, are the voices driving the host to suicide in order to enjoy some evil satisfaction? Or is the victim driven to suicide as the only solution to resolving these thoughts in the head what are you what are you well i i, I think it's that? a little bit of all those things because you know they go to psychiatry and they get drugged up and it doesn't get rid of the voices you know now now they're drugged up they're zombies and they're still hearing the voices they still mm. can't sleep their life is miserable they can't function the voices are at them 24 hours a day it's like hell on earth and and they're thinking the only way to get out of this is is to kill myself yeah. um the other thing is that because because why would they kill the host? You know, it, it well, seems that's another question. Of, that's another question yeah. I had, uh, and, and I've seen a couple of cases where the voices, when the guy's about to kill himself, they actually stop him. But yeah. that's not very often, you know. Mm. Uh, but the other thing is, it takes a lot of guts and and agony to kill yourself. So while you're yeah. contemplating it, 
there's a lot of paranoia and fear and desperation and anger and, and all this stuff, this turmoil of negativity. Like, how am I going to do it? What's going to happen to my Pam family? And da, 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 da. So you got all this negative emotional energy just flowing out that these things are consuming. And the last question is, is, you know, why are they cutting off their energy supply? Um, what, what I've been told by some of them is that they're assigned to that person to make that person miserable and to destroy that person. Like and the I've opposite even, of a guardian angel. Yeah. Yeah. But there are guardian angels out there. I mean, everybody's got at least two of them. So why aren't they protecting? Why aren't they protecting they, the, you know, their human shards? They, 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 they are. Tr they, they try, but they, they. You have to ask them. They're not allowed to interfere with your free will, like these uh, negative ones. Is this where Psalm twenty three would come in? Because it's in a way you're asking your guardian angel or whatever entity it is that's there to protect you to fight back against this negative right. force. I yeah. think that's a big part of it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they, they don't want you, they don't want you on any kind of positive spiritual path. They don't want you reading anything positive. They don't want you happy. They don't want you laughing. They, they hate kids for some reason. They just hate kids. You know, so mm -hmm. when I got one into the ER at the a psychotic mother, I'd be real careful with uh, trying to make sure that she's being watched after real careful. Um, and, and you watch what's going on with these child molesters today, mm -hmm. you know, you know the tra the child trafficking. Mm. You know, at, at our border now, there's thousands of kids disappearing from that border. They're just vanishing. This is the and biggest. It's, it's when it's all it's all it's all allowed by the corrupt deviant leadership, isn't it? You know, yes. it's top down. You know, it's not right. it's not bottom up. It's top down. So, right. which makes me think that you know there's some high functioning uh, um, they are, psychopathic, schizophrenic, you know, people at the top who are indulging in this. Um, you know, uh, cultural uh, negativity that they may be feeding off as a as a big feeding frenzy. But anyway, um, this is all pretty heavy, dark stuff, right? Yeah. How can we switch this to something more positive? What What are the solutions out there? How can can people help themselves? How do you help people? Tell me about your book because that has the it's a light program, in I imagine, and um. Is that offering people who think yeah, that they may be trouble or have the This is, this is the first thing. An amazing this is the first thing I, like I would go mind. after. It, it kind of tells you yeah. what the voices are and how they operate. So you have to understand that these things are thought forms. They're energetic thought forms, and they're feeding off of you. That's the first thing that has to be understood, and that they can be blocked and they can be uh, uh you, you you virtually have to starve them out. Now, th these exorcisms, if you, if you look at these things like your brain is a radio, okay, and you have all these frequencies that you can turn to and listen to. You know, mm -hmm. The gangsters are listening to the gangster frequency, and the, the doctors are listening to the doctor frequency. They're all different frequencies. The schizophrenics are at a very low frequency. You know? So you have to change that frequency to change the behavior. Mm. So even if you shut the radio off, as soon as you turn it back on again, it's going to be set at that same frequency. So that's what the, uh, the uh, psychiatrists are doing. They, they, they try to shut off the radio yeah. Yeah. By, by toxifying the brain so it can't think. And, and these major tranquilizers are there like, uh, 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 uh. but as soon as that wears off their patients still at the same frequency it's the same thing with exorcism they can go in and they can drive out these things temporarily but if that person doesn't get on a positive spiritual path and start moving up that that path and stay there these things are going to come back with much more force did you see any exorcisms during your career because there's two there's two quite famous ones that i you know i've seen a lot of videos on one is father lampert and the other is father Ripiger two Catholic priests who are specialists at exorcisms and practice a lot. And um, there's also Derek Prince, who was a Pentecostal um, exorcist, which is quite rare in the Protestant denomination. I mean, did you ever come across any of these things during your time? Were priests ever called in? Uh, I worked with one in the prison who was kind of like a, a closet exorcist. He didn't want anybody to know that he was. Yeah. Uh, but his patients would come and they would talk to me. 
you know, the people mm -hmm. he was working with. And then I forged a link with him. So we would work together mm -hmm. on some of these guys, you know, where he would do that part mm -hmm. and, and, and do the prayers and that kind of stuff. And they don't like prayers. You know, they, mm -hmm. do, they don't, they don't like, uh, you know, so basically you do the opposite of all the things these things are telling them to do. Negative emotion. That's what mm -hmm. they want most. They they want to trigger that negative emotional energy which they feed off of. You know, they could care less about you. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh they energetically drain their victims like parasites. They get louder after sunset. You know, as soon as the sun goes down, they get louder. And and when I was working uh with psychiatry in the old folks' home, you know, the where the old they call it sundowner syndrome. As soon as the sun goes down, they got more animated, more troublesome, oh, you know, yeah. cause more problems. Yeah. They get louder when ignored. So psychiatry will tell the patients, oh, just ignore them. They're hallucinations. They're nothing. You can't do that. You know, and you can check this out with any, any schizophrenic patient. You try to ignore them. They get louder. They will not be ignored. They demand attention. So they're after your attention constantly. They foster self-destructive behavior. They're always telling you to do things that are against your own uh, benefit. You know, something that's going to hurt you or destroy you or or convince you you're not good. They say things like you're stupid, you're ugly, uh, you can't succeed at this, you can't succeed at that. This guy's talking behind your back. It's all that that kind of stuff. You know, they're constantly filling your head with that kind of stuff. They foster isolation, just like the, these bozos are doing right now with their virus. They want mm -hmm. you isolated. They don't want people getting together. They don't want them having a good time. They want them isolated and alone. So they just can pick on them by themselves. That's why a lot of schizophrenics will lock themselves in the bedroom. They won't come out. Uh, they demand the attention of their victims. You know, you, you can try to, you know, do something else, but they're, they're right there. They're after your attention. They want that. They, they want to hook it. They're like fishermen. They bait the hook with something that they think they'll get you with. They'll throw it out, see if you bite on it. If you bite on it, then you go, oh, my God, this horrible thing. And then you start thinking about that, and they got you. Mm. you know, so they, mm. they try to keep you fixated on a negative thought or a negative emotion or a negative habit. Uh, they maneuver for – they're constantly maneuvering for increased control over the victim until the victim has no control, and they end up in a psychiatric prison hospital somewhere. Those are the guys that need to be in prison. They're constantly gaslighting the victim. Um, I remember one one patient, they convinced him that he had murdered somebody and they, that he hadn't been caught. So he's thinking, well, should I go to the police department and tell them that I murdered somebody when I'm not sure I murdered somebody? Or should I hide from the police? And so he's like in a catch-22, both ways generating a massive amount of negative emotional energy, you know, no matter what he does, uh, they manipulate perception. So um, how many times have you gone like, well, what did he mean by that? Or what, what, what did I say that offended this guy? And then here comes this thought, well, you could have done this or you could have said this or, you, you know, uh, so they manipulate your perception of situations. So it's the most negative perception possible. And then they feed off of that negative energy. Uh, they have complete access to your memory. Uh, they demand that you not tell anybody about about their presence. So the, the voices tell the schizophrenic, don't tell anybody about us. They'll lock you up. They'll think it's you're true. crazy. <laughs> well, and, and it is true. true. <laughs> it is true. Yeah, you got to be um, careful with that one, I think. <laughs> yeah, one, one thing's interesting. I found that most of the time are, are, they kind of hypno hypnotize the patient into this, this mind thing mm. where you get fixated on a negative thought and then it just carries on carries on and most of these schizophrenics have been hearing these voices for decades you know so they're used to them they yeah. they just come on they don't even realize they're there until they get to a certain degree but you know the, what, what i teach patients in in my practice is the things to do to counter them and one of the things to break that hypnotism is to snap a rubber band on your wrist okay now that'll shut them up because in most cases it stuns them and and hurts them more than it hurts the the patient. Mm -hmm. you know, I've only had one voice come back and go, "You think that affects us? You're stupid." And the rest, it would shut them up for a period of time, and then they could start into the exercises that I give them in in clinical practice. Um, you know, the twenty third psalm is one of those things. Mm -hmm. you know, repeat the twenty third psalm. That that's like punching them in the face. 
You know, they hate that. Mm -hmm. um, they're consummate liars. You can't believe anything they say. You know, they lie about everything. You know, and they'll try to bargain with the patient. You do this and we'll go away. Or, or you know, you just have one drink, it'll be okay. Or, or just have, you know, take one shot of meth and everything will be fine. You know, they lie about everything. You can't make any bargains with them because you can't trust them to carry through with anything except stuff that's going to get you in trouble. All the time in the prison, the voices would tell prisoners where to be at what time to get more meth when they needed it. And I talked to scores of, of inmates who listened to the voices. They showed up at the place they were told to be, and somebody would appear out of nowhere with the meth. It, you know, it's strange. They would tell them which houses to rob and what time to break in there. And generally where the loot was, they would tell them if the patient, if the, the owner of the house was up and where to run to, where to hide. I mean, they, here, so they're giving them all these directions. And for a drug addict to, to be able to rob people and to, and to get an unlimited supply of drugs, for them, that's like heaven. Yeah, yeah. You know? They so open the going, floodgates, don't they? They open yeah, the doors yeah. then and say, yeah, 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 you guys come in. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah that's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, we love it, man. I'll stay high for the rest of my life. Uh, they consistently steer the voices away from anything that might generate joy or happiness. They don't want you to be happy. They don't want you to watch America's Funniest Videos. They, uh, mm -hmm. they, they don't want you to be satisfied with your life. They don't want you to be married. They go after marriages. You know, they destroy marriages. They destroy relationships. But the I mean, thoughts you they put in your head. These, these, these are all patterns. Like yeah, but they sound like a, a, a list of, you know, mental illness conditions, you know? So whereas we're thinking, oh, this is just a symptom of a, of a mental illness or a depression or, you know, PTSD or whatever it may be. But in reality, it could be, you know, part of what you're talking about here is that, you know, it's low level uh, influence of your thoughts. Well, yeah, like, it's, it, like I said, it's a continuum. I yeah. mean, everybody has experienced most of these things. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's just a matter of degree. That, that so when, when you're friend. being negative about yourself, right? Because everyone does, you know, occasionally you go through a period where they're down and they feel negative. Is that you? <laughs> is That's that not you? you? Is that you being negative? No. no. Okay. It's not uh, you. Interesting. interesting. No, any, any <laughs> negative thought about yourself or anybody else. I need to bring a priest. Them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it comes from them. I, you know, they, mm. you know, I, I, I did something the other smashed myself with a hammer or something the other day and i'm like you stupid fool and then i'm like okay that that wasn't me <laughs> you, know, mm -hmm. you, you have to keep on it you yeah. know any negative thought about yourself or anybody else comes from them because they want to foster this divisiveness just like the deep state wants to foster divisiveness among us right now mm -hmm. you know they, they want us to fight they they can manipulate feeling without speaking so you know, I don't know how many times I've sat there and then all of a sudden I just start feeling depressed for no reason whatsoever, you know, and then I know, okay, I've, one of them's got in there. You know, um, they short circuit reason. They make things sound reasonable, but they're not, you know, uh, <clears throat> boredom is bad, you know, for a schizophrenic to be bored, to be locked up and isolated like they do, that's the very worst thing you could do for them. You know, mm -hmm. they need to be distracted because when they're bored, these things are feeding on them constantly. You know, they have no respite from them. Uh, they try to pass themselves off as thoughts belonging to the victim. So they want you to believe that they are you, that all these mm -hmm. negative thoughts that, that you have about yourself, that you're stupid, you're ugly, that people are out after you, that you, you, you can't do anything right. They want you to believe that that is you who's telling you that. And if you believe it, it becomes true. It's a lie that you believe that becomes true and you foster it with your faith. So once you give one of these lies that they put into your head, you believe it, you give it your faith and it becomes true. Mm. Right. Uh, selective forgetting. We already talked about that. They can make you forget like the patients I work with. I'll give them a list of exercises that they need to do consistently. And if they don't write them down, they won't remember but a hand, uh, two or three of them by the time they leave my office, you know, so they go after this and they'll, they'll make them forget to do those exercises. They'll distract them from reading the Bible or spiritual stuff. They don't want them moving. So it, it's, you know, the, the cartoon they had of devils on one shoulder and angels on the other. That's exactly what's going on in reality. 
Mm. You know, the devils are speaking in words. They're speaking through the voice in your head that's constantly telling you what to do. And the angels are more like feeling and intuition. You mm. know, like you, know, you sense that something is wrong or you sense that there's something wrong with this person or you know enough to stay away from them. It, it's It's more feeling and intuition. They don't barge in and tell you what to do like these other ones do. So the, the voices are constantly trying to destroy your self-concept. Uh, they attempt to pull their victim away from consensual reality. So the reality that we believe in, they're constantly trying to pull the victim into this alternate reality that they've created. You know, that people are after you or there's monsters out there or that, you know, snakes are in your bed or, or that, you know, something's watching you from the cameras. It's, it's this awful alternate reality. Um, they use confusion as a means of instilling negative suggestions. So, you know, they'll get your, they'll get the schizophrenic real confused, and that's a very nasty state. People don't like to be confused. And then they'll say, okay, now go do this. And they start doing that, and all that confusion disappears. All right? So that's the same thing hypnotists use. Any attempt to inform the schizophrenic patient that the voices are energetic parasites and are draining them will trigger a volatile reaction by the voices consistently you know so when you go to tell them that these things are parasitic entities they go nuts they mm -hmm. just explode you know so you can expect a, a, a thing from them a, a, a very volatile negative reaction so there's a lot of things you can do um one thing is to block them out you know you can't ignore them because they'll get stronger you can't ignore them but you can so block them out as part of your as part of your clinical practice in helping people you um make them aware of all of those um uh, patterns and then yes. work on being able to block each of those patterns either going in the opposite direction or other various methods and treatments of dealing with that and once you've conquered those those patterns is that it you know you've you've extinguished the voices well you haven't extinguished them. You're just aware of the patterns they run. Yeah. Okay. To extinguish them, you have to starve them out and replace them. So it's like the radio where you you have to change the frequency. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to move away and block out. So if you're listening to acid rock, you know, and you're, you're addicted to listening to acid rock and you know the acid rock isn't good for you, you, you can't you ignore it. it. You've yeah. got to replace it. You know, yeah. so you got to block it out and replace it with something else. And mm -hmm. and that's where it doesn't have to be religion. It's mm -hmm. just a positive spiritual path. So if there's these negative entities here, there's also positive entities. Everybody yeah. has at least two guardian angels watching over them mm -hmm. at all times. I mean, I don't know how many times in the ER where it was very clear that these guardian angels saved the person's life. Uh, one lady, I remember one of the most dramatic ones, she was, the voices were telling her to kill herself or she lost her job. Uh, her husband left her. She couldn't make the rent. Everything was going wrong in her life. So she decided she was going to go out to the railroad track, wait for the train to come by, drive in front of the train and, and just off herself. So she drugged herself up. She was talking to her sister in San Diego and the train was coming. She hung up. She started the car. And when the train was almost there, she drove her car right in front of the train. The train hit it, smashed it, threw it up over the train and into a second railroad track where another train was coming in the other direction and hit it also wow. and threw it 50 yards off of the track. She was caught in that in that wrecked car. They had to cut her out of it. She couldn't get out. It was, it was such a crumpled can. And all she had was a black eye and a bloody nose. You know, hit by two freight trains. And I asked her, I said, well, what were you thinking when you came, became conscious and uh, uh, you saw you were still alive? And she said, I was furious. She said, I was absolutely furious, you know, and, and uh, she, she was really pissed. And then I said, well, what, what happened then? She said, well, I, I heard this voice saying everything is going to be fine. Everything is going to be all right. Just, you know, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be fine. She knew that was her guardian angel. Now, yeah, if, your numbers, another... if your number's not up, your number's not up. <laughs> well, in, yeah. in these cases. But there were so many cases like that. I should have been keeping a log of them. Mm -hmm. But but I didn't. It was it was like lobsters when they used they were so plentiful they were with dog food. I mean mm -hmm. the, so many miraculous things. Another guy had a 
357 Magnum with all the cylinders loaded. You know, put it to his head, it would click. Put it to the floor, bang, blew a hole in the floor. Put it to his head, click. And put it to the floor, bang. And he goes, okay, I got it. Any more. Another guy had a, a 45 automatic. Uh, he put it to his head, and click. The next day, he went out to the rifle range, put that same round in, and it went off. You know, story after story after story. One one lady shot herself right in the heart, which she said was a 357 Magnum, and it missed all the all the crucial organs. You know, it right just through. went right through, went right through, went into the wall, went out the house, and and here she is sitting here in front of me after shooting herself a few hours ago. She's got a, a big band aid on either side, and she's like nothing happened. You know. It's, so, it's, so you retired from um, your career, and then you've set up a private practice now where you. Well, I've only recently started that because, you know, from these interviews, people would contact me, uh, you know, all okay. the time. Can you help me? Can you help me? And, you know, I was kind of burnt out. It's like, oh, man, it's like, you know, 40 years of this and now more. Just when I thought and of it, sure. they pull you back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So here it comes again. Oh, you think you're getting out, huh? No, you're not getting out. You know? yeah. And then you got guys like you, like, hey, come out and tell us what you've learned. I, mean, I can't not do that, you know? So it's like. The big hand has got me back, throws me back in again. So a few months ago, Sherry, my cohort, my my uh, co, you know, the, that book wouldn't exist if it wasn't for her. I mean, she she was like the bulldog that, you know, I, I wrote most of it. She pushed it through. I mean, she, I couldn't have done it without her. Um, she goes, well, you've got all these people writing you asking for your help anyway. Why don't you just start up your practice again? And I go, I, I, I don't know about that. And so she said, you, you can just work with the people you want to, the people who are really motivated. And I'm like, well, that's okay. You know, mm -hmm. so that's okay. So she put up a, on my site, she put up a consult page on the site. And and I can pick and choose. So what I got now is I have, uh, I work with one person a day on, on the days I'm not doing something else. The ones who aren't motivated, I'll drop and put somebody else in. Uh, and the ones that are, are working are doing good. Mm. You know, you getting, so hopefully... You are you getting some success from, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah, help, yeah. getting rid of the voices in people's heads? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. George, uh, if you go to my website and you look up the interviews with George Jagatik, he was a therapist who was working in a psychiatric hospital in New York and began using meth. And he got addicted to meth. He started seeing the shadow people and hearing voices. Uh, he knew what the voices were, but he didn't know what to do about them. So he wrote me, he says, hey, I was a therapist, I got strung on meth, and I, uh, yeah, I contacted him, I said, okay, you know what, you know what they are, that's, you're halfway there, you know, so if you go to my site, and you look at the uh, interviews with George Jagatik, yeah, have a you look. Know, yeah. we've, we've yeah. virtually got rid of all his voices now, he's, in, he's back in control, he, he had a job, he's doing good, uh, he's actually working with people himself now, and that's several good. in the prison, I, I got in trouble in the prison for helping prisoners because they would tell psychiatry hey i don't need any medicines anymore i'm done and you know they they what had well what happened what happened well he 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 helped us jerry helped us so the chief psychologist found out about that instead of being happy he put me under investigation he had all these these guys come down and ask all these all my uh Oh my how prisoners. did that feel? I mean, how did that feel? Because you had this breakthrough with these patients. I, I, I was shocked. Their lives were immeasurably improved. And, you know, it was, was, I, I was demoralizing. I was shocked. I was absolutely yeah. shocked. I, you know, because I was like, well, they don't have to pay for these expensive medicines anymore. These guys are better. They're not causing problems on the yard. They can go out and function in society now. The voices are gone. And here's these the, the chief psychologist pacing around like some kind of demon, sending down other psychologists to investigate what I was doing in my sessions. Wow. But none of my patients would tell them anything. <laughs> none of them. So he didn't yeah. have anything. So he calls this inquisition where he drags me up in front of the medical director, accuses me of doing all this stuff, you know, that was uh, experimenting with prisoners is what he he accused me of doing, which I guess is what I was doing. Mm. I was asking him questions. Yeah, I was experimenting. What works and what doesn't work? Will yeah. this tactic work? Does it, how much does it work? Is this one better? You know, what do you do? How do you fight these things? So uh, I guess I was exper. But boy, he was trying to get me fired as fast as he possibly could. Mm. And uh, then it came. 
what really torqued him off once was they had a valid MMPI on one patient that I was working with who had completely cleared, no more voices at all, went off his medications, he was doing great. His, his MMPI that he took when he got into prison, which is the gold standard for psychologists as far as measuring any kind of mental illness, showed that he was clearly psychotic. Okay, So after he uh, his stooge grilled this particular patient, and the patient said, he's helping us, not like you, asshole. That flamed him. Mm -hmm. So then he said, well, would you be willing to take another MMPI? Because they already had a valid one saying the guy was psychotic. So he gave the, the prisoner another MMPI, and he came out non-psychotic. The, the profile was valid. So it showed mm -hmm. that something I was doing was mm -hmm. actually getting rid of these things mm -hmm. and helping these people. And then they went nuts. Then they really started going after me. You know, because that for them, that was proof that I was doing something that they didn't approve of. You know, crazy, that prison man. was a very dark place. There, were, there was mm -hmm. no good deed went unpunished in that place. Mm -hmm. and, and that was one of the worst. Okay, well, um, Jerry, I'm, I promise to keep it under two hours, and I think we're going to try and stick to it. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, chatting to you about this subject, which is as vast, you know, it's just a bottomless uh, subject that we could talk days and days about and i hope to be able to do that with you again maybe we can speak to some of the people that you've been working with we can bring uh jenny or or uh, uh george george on you know yeah. george is still he's still fighting with the voices but he's pretty much got him under control so you you, you could you were talking about a high functioning schizophrenic George is <laughs> one. The... okay well until next time jerry thanks so okay. much see you later. Bye. all right take care